This is the Cataloging Hidden Special Collections and Archives Symposium, subtitled Innovation, Collaboration, and Models. And you'll be hearing all day long, I think, some very interesting aspects and examples of innovation and collaboration. I'd also like to thank, um, as we get started, the program officers and staff at CLEAR who have put together, I think, a very vibrant agenda today, and also thank the Kislak Center and the University of Pennsylvania Libraries for hosting this event. So very briefly this morning, um, I'm going to go through some statistics and show you what you all have been doing for the last seven years. Um, this project, the uh, Cataloging Hidden Collections and Archives, um, began uh, in 2008 and ran until essentially this year. As you can see, we have given away 129 grants at, for a total of $27.5 million. Um, and you can see that a, a, almost a majority of the grants went to academic libraries, but there was a nice dispersal of other kinds of cultural organizations, including museums and public libraries and archives, historical societies. So it's a nice, it's a nice swath of uh, representation. Um, we also, uh, through this grant program, um, 25 of the awarded uh, institutions collaborated on projects, and this was something we really had hoped to do, hoped to see in the beginning and encouraged it throughout, uh, that the collaboration was uh, as an often an essential part were various collections um, that were held in institutions that might not know of the other's holdings, that the review panel would come in and say, we've got in one year, we had three wonderful um, uh, proposals on civil rights materials. All of them were uh, individuals, and they didn't know that there were the other two um, had uh, sent in proposals as well. And the panel got back to these three institutions and said, boy, if you put this together, it'd be a tremendous proposal. And they did, and it was. And so that sort of got us moving on um, trying to encourage collaboration whenever we could. 10% um, of the projects funded were international. So you can see, uh, again, I think some remarkable statistics here. Meta metadata for over 209,000 items, uh, including 180,000 photographs, artworks, digital images, postcards, 3,000 finding aids, and 82,000 mark records. Very impressive. You all have been very busy. And, you know, so what did this, what, what have we heard? through interviews and, and surveys and conversations with you all, what has come out of this, aside from the numbers, aside from the statistics? And uh, to me, this is a, uh, a marvelous um, catalog, if you will, of, of reactions and um, sort of evidence of, of the importance of this program. Everything, first jobs for new professionals came through these grants. Research guides were created. New courses came from this, that there was a really strong pedagogical aspect to this, this project that we hadn't thought about much in the beginning, but grew over time. Many, many presentations uh, at symposia and conferences that many of you, in fact, uh, have participated in. Um, performances have come out of this, and not the least, um, longer, more abiding and binding institutional partnerships and collaboration. So today, who is here? Uh, we have 172 people attending, 75 presenters, 55 recipient institutions, and 66 unique hidden collections. Uh, projects are represented here. So again, a wonderful showing that we're very grateful for, you, for all your work. So I'd like to, at this point, transition um, to our panelist, our key speaker today. I say panelist because she and I have been on the review panel now for many, many years. Uh, and Professor Jacqueline Goldsby. Um, Jackie is the chair of the uh, African American Studies program at Yale University. And my staff and I know Jackie best through um, Jackie's uh, enormous, um, important contributions to the Hidden Collections review panel. Jackie was on the panel for many years, and we, to this day, continue to talk about the remarkable insight um, and the remarkable compassion that she evidenced uh, for the value of our cultural heritage, and not just the value of cultural heritage for teaching and research, but the value of our cultural heritage uh, for a vibrant intellectual society. And as a, as a final note for this, um, 
when the staff and I sat down in 2008 and wrote the first uh, proposal, the first draft for the Mellon Grant that gave rise to this program, uh, in that proposal we cited this remarkable effort that was underway uh, in Chicago, at the University of Chicago. And this effort had to do, uh, it entailed a collaboration of librarians, graduate students, and faculty who would go around to the various institutions in the Chicago area, uncover um, materials and collections pertinent to African American studies, and then catalog them using acceptable standards, but doing so mostly through graduate students and uh, in a very cost-effective and efficient way. The goal of this activity was to make these wonderful materials that were heretofore hidden accessible to the public. That was the project that was headed by Jackie at the time, and we said in the grant proposal, this is, this is a beautiful piece of work, and this is the model on which we want to build. And here we are today. It is a great pleasure to welcome Professor Jacqueline Goldsby, and her topic this morning is Parting the Waters, Clears Pathway to the Archive. Welcome, Jackie. First of all, Chuck, thank you so much for that wonderful, gracious um, introduction. And I'm really grateful to you for inviting me to think with you about the extraordinary achievements that Clear its Hidden Collections Cataloging Program has accomplished in its seven-year run. Um, the opportunity is an honor in itself, and I'm really grateful uh, to you for the invitation. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually happy to be here. Uh, <laughs> being around people who work in archives makes me happy. Uh, so I just want to say that, too. Um, I also want to thank the CLEAR staff members who've collaborated with me to prepare my talk and to literally get me here. Um, to Nicole Ferriolo, thank you so much for arranging my travel logistics. I appreciate your time dealing with those details. Um, to Amy Luco and Krista Williford, I'm grateful for your prompt and as always thorough so responses to my inquiries about the grant program's history. Um, I hope that the ideas I've derived from our exchanges about that information will be useful to you. It certainly has been thought provoking for me. And finally, uh, to all of you gathered here today, I want to thank you for your stewardship of the cultural heritage materials that made this program the success that it is. Whether your organization received a clear grant or not, you best know the labor and politics involved in unhiding hidden collections. Recovering those valuable materials for public uses is, is an astonishing, extraordinary, thrilling, inspiring. I could keep going on with the superlatives. I think you get my point. But it's a singular achievement. And this is one time I'll hazard to speak categorically on behalf of researchers, teachers, and students everywhere, as well as the reading, thinking, and learning publics at large to say thank you for the vital and essential work you do to make knowledge production, teaching, and learning possible. The title of my talk deserves an explanation, or rather, a confession. I wish I could credit my inspiration to Taylor Branch's magisterial study of the civil rights movement, because that illusion would suggest I believe the Clear's Hidden Collection Cataloging Program succeeded because it advances information access as a civic right. Now, I do think that that case can be made, Moreover, that view informs my remarks today. However, that intellectual genealogy didn't inspire my talk's title. Instead, my title stems from a guilty pleasure. Every March, so in about two weeks, I watch Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. I might rationalize this ritual by claiming to study Cold War allegories of anti-communist statecraft, but that's not true. <laughs> My mother started me on this habit. She was a huge film buff, admired Charlton Heston, and relished well-choreographed visual spectacles. So I have to admit, the image of Heston, arms thrust wide against the roiling black sky, intoning his commands in fine prophetic mode, Yul Brynner, Edward G. Robinson, and the other faux Egyptians shocked in <laughs> awe as the waters of the Red Sea part, that image immediately sprang to mind as the icon I needed to focalize this talk. I thought about showing you a clip, but I'm going to spare <laughs> you the peek into my imagination. I concede that the religious illusion or the film's kitsch excess, maybe both, 
might offend secularists and modernists in the, in the audience. But the scene staging of the proverbial making a way out of no way strikes me as a visceral but useful emblem that acknowledges the special effects that Clear's funding played in the success of the cataloging initiative. As I understood Barbara Jones's ARL white paper, Hidden Collection Scholarly Barriers, and Mark Green and Dennis Meissner's field-changing manifesto, More Product, Less Process, hidden collections imposed a staggering burden upon archives and cultural heritage repositories because the uninventoried boxes, uninventoried boxes of materials, the overcrowded shelving spaces, the understaffed processing units, the patrons clamoring for materials unaware that ones more suitable for their projects sat just several linear feet away, made it hard for archivists to devise efficient strategies to uncover, to recover uncatalogued manuscript collections, let alone film, photography, and born digital sources. The financial, human, and technological capital required to relieve and reverse those shortfalls needed to be commanding in its own right. Clear's multi-year, multi-million dollar funding capacity did border on something we might call miraculous, partly because it had money to grant that wasn't then presently available. More importantly, because Clear targeted hidden collections explicitly, its funding operated with both fine precision and wide-ranging scale that fostered breakthrough strategies the repositories can now use not only to unhide collections, but to keep those holdings visible and accessible throughout a collection's life cycle. Here, for instance, I'm thinking of my own institution. The Beinecke Library now regularly, regularly posts on its website recently acquired but uncatalogued collections. So at least I assume they know the collections are there, but we users know that they're there as well. And I assume that other repositories have comparable kinds of practices. Judging from their titles and abstracts, the posters and papers presented at yesterday's unconference and today's symposium examine more precisely how these news protocols function in situ, on the ground. I want to stress here that those inroads were made possible because of CLEAR's large-scale, longer-tail funding capacity. As Chuck just cited, the $27.5 million distributed to the 129 projects across the U.S. and Canada has created not just one, but multiple pathways for knowledge, and knowledge production to reach new shores. And indeed, it's not an exaggeration to proclaim that the collections, of, that the collections unhidden through CLEAR's cataloging initiative can and will transform the landscapes of research, teaching, and public engagement in humanist studies here in the U.S. and around the world. Truly, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to call up the, the hidden collections registry here, the range of materials that's been recovered is logistic logistically staggering, as Chuck detailed earlier, but it's intellectually thrilling. I mean, I'm happy with this thing. Um, so let me talk a little bit about it. I really am. Um, I cannot wait to steer my students and colleagues to the riches that await us in Clear's Hidden Collections Registry. Even though this database is still a work in progress and might be refined further, as Krista Williford has advised me, in its current state, the registry is an extraordinary resource because of its main differences from other databases like Archives USA. And here I'm speaking as a user. Right. First, the Collections Federated and Clears Registry are implicitly the freshest, rawest primary sources available precisely because they've been previously hidden. Users can't readily draw that distinction using Archives USA. I mean, you might go in there and look under the collection name for Carl Van Vechten, you know, who, whose papers are widely studied, routinely studied, um, but you'd never know that necessarily, right? When you go to the clear hidden collections registry, you know, at least for the next couple <laughs> years probably, that the collections that you're looking at haven't been touched by anyone. And that's really exciting for researchers, right? Second, the collections federated in Clear's registry are searchable along multiple pathways, seven, compared to Arch Archives USA's two. And these search routes hold remarkable potential as user-friendly portals. Which ones and why? So if you look here, this is quite helpful because the thematic cues of these titles provide a sharper sense of a given collection's likely content. That's not always the case in every title, but it's typically the case for me as a user anyway. 
The three subject portals, if you look along the side, narrow by subject, there are two boxes there. And then the subject ca tag cattle cl cloud here, along with the keyword search box, function under expected ways, but with an important twist. Unfamiliar individuals, organizations, practices, or events can be discovered through and then linked to broader, more commonly recognized topics. So to take a topic that I know well, um, let's look at civil rights here, just going through the, the subject tag cloud. That, uh, okay, brings us to a set of 63 collections, okay? Um, but, for instance, I might not have known going into this who Margaret Bush Wilson was um, or that she was a civil rights movement activist, but here she is. Um, and so by indexing her papers, I mean, the t again, here we see the, pa the, the project title helping and then the subject tag um, cloud helping us to locate her in under civil rights. And so her career becomes placed and legible in that historical field. And then once I'm in this field, the research opportunities start knocking loudly. For instance, um, if we tr track it here through the CSU archives on activism, culture, and diversity in Southern California, um, just the idea of Southern California might get a student thinking about, hmm, let me think about civil rights in a regional kind of way, moving away from the US sou South, moving away from its proverbial you know, counterpoint, the North, going West going to the southwest, going to the far west. And once I'm open to that suggestion, then a student or I might think differently about the politics of segregation, right? Because I could go from Wilson's papers and in that field of the civil rights tag, find the CSU archives project, and where I learned that activism, culture, and diversity in Southern California includes papers from the McFarland collection which is, we see here, deals with Japanese American relocation after World War II. Well, that becomes really interesting because then we might think about African American wartime migration and housing settlement patterns in Los Angeles, Long Beach, and other port cities um, differently when we think about those movements against the backdrop of Japanese Americans' removals from their neighborhoods and property, right? And as an English professor, when I teach a novel like Julio Tsuka's um, When the Emperor Was Divine, gorgeous, gorgeous novel about a family being relocated uh, to the camps in um, Utah, uh, this would be a very interesting kind of cultural frame to set around that novel, right? Um, and that's the kind of work you can do with this registry. Now, I've, uh, I'm pledging to you, I promise, 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 that I will use this site in my research seminars and thesis advising at Yale. Can you imagine the AP high school, college, and graduate level instructors who could also send their students to the Hidden Collections Registry to explore possible research projects? Can you envision documentarians that might comb the registry for leads to unlistened to sound recordings, never before seen prints, photographs, and films to inspire multimedia projects? I'm sure you can imagine these scenarios. They're probably already happening in your organizations. If that's so, fantastic. The point I want to make here, though, is a request. I'd respectfully encourage all of you, and clear, <laughs> to channel your inner Charlton Heston as Moses <laughs> and lead the publics you serve to the Hidden Collections Registry more assertively. This shouldn't be a hard story to sell. The recovery of original, fascinating, inspiring, never or hardly used archival collections, the labors you've expended to organize them, all of this is so mediagenic, it really is. Um, and so, so that it could be spread and should be spread as widely as possible, really. The work that you've accomplished here deserves publicity on the scale of a Cecil B. DeMille spectacle. It really does. It really, really does. But I'm highlighting the registry for this effort, though, instead of the individual social media sites established for individual projects, which you can find on the, um, where is it? The Project Related Resources page, right? Very cool stuff. Um, but the point I want to make here is this. Um, the registry, I think, centralizes and focuses attention on the whole collective lot 
of unhidden collections that are now known and available for use. Again, I think the, so the individual social media sites that many of you have probably set up, fascinating. I, I actually got lost for a whole day tracking the different Facebook pages, the Twitter feeds, and the links that, 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 that were embedded in them. And I learned, I bookmarked so many things to follow up on. Um, and that's great, but I think that the hidden collections registry br brings everybody's attention to the whole instead of to the single project. So that a federated publicity strategy aimed at directing a more varied and mass public to converge upon this shared portal will drive a broader range of users to your repositories, I'm certain. But that order of publicity might also leverage a second effect of aligning new allies and advocates for the ongoing work you do as well. Clear's cataloging grant program and the Hidden Collections Registry are remarkable for a third and final reason I want to discuss. As anthropologist and cultural theorist Ann Laura Stoller observes in her wonderful book, Along the Archival Grain, transparency is not what archival collections are known for. And this problematic has been the focal point of what she calls the archival turn. That is, the shift in scholarly emphasis from relying on archives as resources for study to critiquing them as objects of study. I'm sure you're familiar with the body of criticism that defines this turn. I refer here to such works as Michel Foucault's The Archaeology of Knowledge, Jacques Derrida's Archive Fever, Michel Rotrieux's Silencing the Past, Carolyn Steedman's Dust, and Diana Taylor's The Archive and the Repertoire, to name a few. These works offer bracing, important challenges to the institutional formations of libraries and archives that have sustained opacities, exclusions, and suppressions of various kinds. However, I want to suggest that, taken together, Claire's cataloging initiative, the innovative work you've done arranging and describing those collections, and the Hidden Collections Registry proffer a different theory of the archive. The relational archives, conceptual underpinnings, what I'm, that's the term I'm using here, the relational archives, conceptual underpinnings on the one hand and its social political capacities on the other hand, are important to name because its features may help us confront the sobering but necessary fact that this conference itself portends. How to move forward processing still hidden collections now that Clear's cataloging grant program has ended. To address that pressing question, let me first define what I mean by relational archive. My use of the phrase and concept is inspired by visual studies theorist Nicholas Bouillard's relational aesthetics. In that study, Bouillard explains why contemporary art during the 1990s and 2000s moved away from traditional plastic mediums, such as painting, sculpture, and drawing, to embrace performance-based works in which acts of human contact and sociability were not simply the subject of the work, but the form of the artwork itself. A recent well-publicized example would be Mariana Abramovich's 2010 installation, or event, depends on how you want to read it, at MoMA, the artist is present. In that piece or event, Abramovich sat in a chair in a large empty room for three months straight, while visitors lined up for the chance to sit directly across from her for as long as they chose. The viewers could speak to Abramovich and she wouldn't reply to them. <laughs> There's the art, right? Um, but Boyard calls these works relational because they actively engage the viewer in making the artwork function and visible as such. We couldn't know that the artist was present unless that viewer was there sitting with her trying to talk or engaging her and Abramovich not responding. The viewer's presence made that work what it is, right? In an era where communications technology and global capital atomize us as much as they link us together, dialogue, Brouillard argues, grants form a productive status. As part of a relationist theory of art, intersubjectivity does not only represent the social setting for the reception of art, it also becomes the quintessence of artistic practice. Let me re repeat that last line. As a part of a relationist theory of art, intersubjectivity, the Intersubjectivity does not only represent the social setting for the reception of art, it also becomes the quintessence of artistic practice. I see Bouillard's concept of relationality at work when I study the Hidden Collections Registry's subject tag, 
cloud, for instance. That visualization calls to mind the many applications I reviewed in which repositories promised to design social tagging protocols to involve non-professionals in the intellectual labor, labor of identifying and categorizing the materials of a given collection. Likewise, the range and comparative scales of subject areas visualized by the tag's font sizes bespeaks a new sensibility as to what counts as research-worthy ob knowledge objects in the first place, as do the formats of those knowledge objects. In turn, this diversity mirrors the variations we see in the kinds of repositories that were eligible to see clear funding at all, ranging from academic special collections to local historical societies to other cultural heritage nonprofit organizations. The archive encompasses the multifarious and amorphous forms it's always been. And finally, in one of the most remarkable relational patterns, collaborative grants linking institutions together weren't uncommon in Clear's cataloging initiative, as Chuck's details already pointed out. But here I would want to put a little bit more pressure on that to, to make a point. Um, it's fantastic that 25% of the funded collections represented collaborations and that 10% of them, as Chuck cited, um, involved in international partnerships, right? But the prevailing wisdom seems to hold that digitization best realizes this kind of connectivity. Not cataloging, but digitization. That interests me, right? Um, in a provocative lecture at ARL's Fall 2009 forum on the fate and function of special collections in contemporary times, the Mellon Foundation's program officer, Donald Waters, argued that digitization, digitization will transform special collections into common ones because such co endeavors can promote collection sharing instead of institutional competition for primary source materials. Fine. And moreover, he observed, to the extent that digitization destabilizes the idea of institutional ownership, other definitions of value can inform digital-based archival collections. Now, I don't disagree with those propositions at all. But interestingly, these very same principles were asserted in the work you've been doing, cataloging hidden collections, it seems to me, and in CLEAR's cataloging grant proposal itself. I refer here to its explicit criteria criteria of interoperability that required applicants to participate in an iterative exchange process when developing their proposals, and the cyber infrastructure that was imagined, quote, to facilitate building virtual organizations that transcend geographic and institutional boundaries and interlocking of technical and social elements. Put another way, again, processing and cataloging hidden collections differently, but no less than digitization, articulated a relational view of the archive, too. This paradigm shift in, so in the social logic and role of the archive rates for me as one of the key achievements of CLEAR's cataloging initiative. Precisely because metrics don't seem to bear it out, though, we can and therefore should assess its impacts in culturalist terms. Here, Ann Stoller's insight into what counts as an archival event is worth recalling, and here I want to quote her at a bit of length. We should think about archival events with and against Foucault's compelling injunction to treat them as reversals of a relationship of forces, the usurpation of power, the appropriation of a vocabulary turned against those who once use it. Such an approach undoes the, uns the certainty that archives are stable things with ready-made and neatly draw boundaries. But the search for a dramatic reversal, usurpation, and successful appropriation can hide events that are more muted in their consequences, less bellicose in their seizures, less spectacular in what they reframe. Here, I treat archival events more as moments that disrupt, if only provisionally, a field of force, that challenge, if only slightly, what can be said and done, that question, if only quietly, epistemic warrant, that realign the certainties of the probable more than they mark whole-scale reversals of direction." Close quote. Now, I, I cite this passage at length because Stowers' insights allow us to appreciate how needles move, to put it another way, which is to say, what might come next in our common work. We can't be naive about this. The vexing context that shaped current educational policy also threatened the momentum Clear's cataloging grant program has built. The creative disruptions triggered by constant technological change, 
the diversification, arguably fragmentation, of learning publics, and most devastatingly, the disinvestment in humanist research, teaching, and learning by local, state, and federal government put a sharper point on the imperative I raised at the outset of my talk. How do we keep this work and the funding that supports it moving forward? I would argue we, we do this by extending the work and organizational logics of the relational archive. The archival common sense it introduces as an, ins as an institutional practice marks a strategic pathway forward for two reasons. The concept of relationality places clarifying pressure on prevailing critical theories that posit the archive to be always already subjugating, dominating, or imperial. Those accounts whose historical critiques I support, but whose trans-historicizing impetus I take issue with, should be distinguished from the relational archive that Clear's Hidden Collections Initiative has set in motion. Because the kind of archive we need to justify and fund in and for our present historical moment has found viable, compelling, inspiring forms through the practices that your projects have tested and Clear's cataloging grant program has supported. Indeed, the strategies you've devised to unhide hidden collections has transformed the quintessence of archival practice, to adapt Bouriard's phrase that I cited earlier. Facilitating outreach to and collaboration with non-professionals to process collections, redefining what counts as an archival repository and its knowledge objects, developing technologies and practices that dislodge traditional claims of originality, rarity, accessibility, and use of knowledge objects, Collating that descriptive information within the registry's single shared portal, this model of the archive, again, which your projects launched, is one that more readily invites us all, library professionals, scholars, students, and the lay public, to forge partnerships that can foster and sustain collections management work for the short and long term. Why? Because the relational archive acknowledges we all belong to it. The Relational Archive functions when we all labor in and on its behalf. The Relational Archive requires our collective capital, human and financial, to make its form possible. Tackling the hidden collections problem has been key to this transformation. And precisely because CLEAR's cataloging initiative has come to its end, we can see relationality for what it is, an archival mode and form whose time has come, whose time is now. Thank you.